So let me, let me make sure I understood what, what your point is by trying to repeat it. Um, what you're saying is that uh, it's all fine for me to say that things have gotten better with parallel programming, but you've got a bunch of students, and like this many of them actually get to where they would be willing to do it, and maybe even fewer of that actually succeed and they're good at it. The tool, will, the tool might actually increase the number of students who will actually do it, but it won't really change the order of magnitude or the, the percentage you know, that you will get. So, and in addition, you also need to look at, you know, you actually need to have an, an engineering-oriented computer science program. That um, uh, speaking as somebody who has a mechanical engineering degree, I will not argue with that at all. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. So, so it's, you know, that's, it's extremely difficult to produce students who are able, who are capable of doing this stuff. So uh, if, you, if you'd asked me when I got my undergraduate degree, uh, longer ago than I care to admit, some decades back, I would have made exactly the same point but about programming instead of parallel programming. That uh, of the people who went through the program, a rather small number of them could actually you know, take a problem and wrestle it to the ground. So let me, let me give the answer uh, about this. So let's go back 500 years. Uh, there's a story, it's probably apocryphal, but it's uh, uh, worth considering. A, a German uh, tradesman had a son that he wanted to get ready to take over the business. And so he wanted to know where he should, what he should do for the kid's education. He was in his teens and wanted to do the kind of finishing education. So he went to a local professor at a local university and asked him. And the professor says, well, it depends on what you need him to do. If, uh, he, for, if the business only requires him to master addition and subtraction, then one of the universities here in Germany should be well up to the job. If he needs multiplication, he needs to go to Italy. <laughs> 500 years later, we te you know, we're teaching this to our kids. And yeah, we complain about the math scores, but you don't have to go to university to do multiplication in most cases. I think part of Germany's problem back then was that they were still using Roman numerals, but still. So, so thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you. I, I will not resist the impulse to throw in my two cents, which is, I think what Paul is saying is even though this stuff seems tricky to us now, lots of other stuff has seemed tricky to us and has not seemed tricky later on. And the other position is, well, but there's some stuff that seemed tricky before and still seems tricky. And I, I think that those are probably both sides of that argument as far as I know, and then why one is right or the other is the mean of it. So, I got another side. What? I got another side. Yeah, please. But it, eventually, people figure out the problem and figure out can solutions to it. And that's essentially why yes. we have more programming now, is because we've got people using can solutions to problems. Like, you know, almost all the people in Carol Burger today use MacReduce or some higher level construct. So what you do is you find a way of encapsulating intelligence and then making it broader, more and more broadly available to people. Which is, which is the point Doug has been making over and over today. <laughs> but, but I still suspect that it will take much longer and will be much more difficult to turn uh, parallel programming into CAN solutions uh, as opposed to sequential programming, you know. I don't know if I agree with that. I, I attended a talk in the uh, mid to late 70s. Um, a guy from the Netherlands that uh, you might recognize the name of. He was claiming that you couldn't trust people to correctly do, do loops, that they couldn't be expected to code them, it was difficult, and that something horrible had to be done. Mm -hmm. Now you could have, this is as your dice actually. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I think the guy was largely correct. <laughs> well, we, but the, thing, the thing is, is that what we've done is we've come up with First off, I think that he was over, he, what he did was he pulled, in his talk, he pulled out this just horrible loop yeah. that uh, had a weird bug that was just like, well, why'd you do it that way? Yeah. Uh, so I think part of it is what you said. We'll come up with, we've come up with iterators. Yeah. We've come up with, here's how you do a for loop. We've got a lot, a lot of practice. People look at, here's how you do it right, it works, and do the cookie cutter approach. The, the other thing is that we've also learned, uh, don't do it that way. You know, there's a bunch of things for which, just don't do it that way. Yep. And uh, his loop that he used an example is the lab case. Yeah. Anyway, I don't think it's going to be Before you go, I just want to say economics. I think if there's a whole lot of money to be made from people learning how to do this stuff and doing it, that will attract the very the people who can towards it, and they will do what it takes. Go ahead, Doug. 
So it's very fun. Like, here's my simple-minded model of programmers. Every programmer has a, a characteristic um, mistakes per, um, per minute. And the more tools you have, or the more code they do not have to write, the, the, the mistakes per minute um, ratio will go down because the tools fix mistakes and the code they won't write in won't have to be written from. And the tools will get to where they're writing some of the code that slows them down so they have three mistakes per minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so the, the more we can do that, the, the more people who make lots of mistakes can program. I have a and great. Uh, finish your sentence, and then I'll have a great counterexample. Okay. Um, I'm done with my sentence. Okay. So, <laughs> so you know, in the self days, I agreed with you completely. Better language, garbage collection, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it was true for self. Recently, I've tried a library called Thrust. How many people know Thrust? So Thrust uses C++ templates and an STL style of device vectors to make it uh, possible to write very terse programs almost in an APL style that use CUDA very powerfully and it's got built-in sorting algorithms and stuff like that. I went to do something very simple in Thrust and what I found out was um, I would all the time get these pages of incomprehensible error messages from the compiler. I'm new to, t I've been afraid of templates most of my career. This was my, right? And, and uh, you know, I made mistakes that, that I had no idea what the mistake was and it's huge. So what I had was reduced to doing was basically commenting everything out but one line from an example, add another line, get a huge number of errors, try it about 10 different ways to find the one that didn't produce the error. And that was a case where the tooling um, may have made me more productive than writing a good sword in CUDA from scratch, but it sure didn't follow your model of optimal, you um, know... That's just called C++ programming. I stopped arguing, yes. I'm sorry, what did you say? What's the um, first thing you said? C++ template error messages, yeah. um, and, and tools should not be in the same sentence. Yeah, I, 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 that's, a, that's a key point, or a key nit I have on that. Uh, we got people who are proficient with C++ templates calling parallel programming hard and complex. I mean, what is this? <laughs> well, I thought I was proficient with C++. I used C++ <coughs> templates a bunch in my own stuff, but the problem was the errors had to do with the library and library templates, and I was, and it was trying to match stuff with experimental parts of the library, and uh, never mind. Anyway, uh, next next question, comment, thought. Go I'm ahead, Doug. Sorry for following up on myself, but um, here's another way of saying this, is um, I, I, I teach a junior senior level course in current, current programming, and I teach a junior senior level course in advanced data structures, and in both the opening courses, I say, this is a course on careful programming. Um, you know, creating a V-tree, not easy. Creating a non-blocking cube, not easy. Level of difficulty, commensurate. Now, we do not have people in that can be implementing V-trees from scratch very often these days. And we ought not to have people creating new non-blocking cubes from scratch these days. I will say that reading Paul's stuff helped me think about the parallel programs I wrote. Help me, help me write them better. So, but there was a lot I had to learn in there to get to that point. Uh, Hans, do you look like you want to speak? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether I'm agreeing with you or somewhat, somewhat disagreeing with you, but I mean, one of the issues we have with parallel programming, I think that we don't have in the sequential case, is that we don't know how to write, write library specifications. So, I mean, people talk about linearizability, which, in my view, sort of addresses only half the problem because it doesn't talk about the memory ordering issue implications of these calls, which is really critical for synchronization primitives. Um, and, uh, and for a lot of these library specifications, there are sort of corner cases or possible corner cases that we really don't specify. I mean, if I use queues to implement Decker's algorithm, does that work? I don't know. <laughs> well, let, let me ask a question. Uh, hold on, guys. Let me pose a question and see a show of hands. This is an interesting thing. How many people think abstraction 
kind of the sort you're talking about, that abstract specifications, is possible in the world of performant parallel programming with different platforms that have different characteristics. Uh, raise your hand. Okay. However, I'd, like to, I'd like to qualify this. Uh, premature abstraction is the root of all evil. Okay. Yeah. Now, how many people think uh, it's it's like not possible or not practical or hopeless or, or hard to see a way to it? Oh, the well, long time I see a way to it. I see it's hard to see a Yes, I think it's hard to see a way to it. Okay. Well, let, let me ask it separately. How many people think it's just hard to see a way to it? Hard to see it to abstraction. How many people think? It's prob could be, could be impossible. Okay, so uh, are folks interested in following up this line for a minute? Should we ask the minority for for their reasons? Because that might be the most interesting. Max. That sounds great to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, Mark? That sounds great. Because he is the minority. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Max, you go well, first. Then yeah, Mark. So I'm in favor of abstractions. Uh, don't get me wrong. I like abstractions. But the thing is, I don't have a whole lot of confidence that the abstractions that we have managed to sort of can, the can solutions, are necessarily always the right ones to use. Um, and so, I mean, building systems by piling abstractions upon abstractions until you sort of get to the point where anybody can sort of do meaningful work by reusing everybody else's abstractions is great. That's the way we have to go. However, the individual cans, I don't necessarily trust as being the right ones. Okay, and, and Martin, and then... And yes, I, so I, I think the, the difficulty of obtaining reusable abstraction for performance is, you know, you always have an opinion space. You know, the abstraction always gives you more than you need, in which case, it does the performance worse than you want, or it gives you less than you need, in which case you can't use it. So, so when you try to build on top of the abstractions, if you really care about performance, you find yourself building your own abstraction for precisely your case because you can squeeze, you, you can get the right point in space with your abstraction. Yeah, I, I want to say that uh, people know I really like Korzybski's work on abstraction. And he points out that any abstraction is a process of focusing on some things and deliberately not paying attention to yeah. other things. Right. And, and the question is, uh, can that work in this world? And uh, I don't know. But go ahead, Tom. Just to go farther with that, the thing I was going to say is it's multidimensional. We've always done abstraction on a functional sense, you know, what's the function offered by this thing, as opposed to abstraction related to, you know, concurrency issues performance, as opposed to abstraction about memory consumption. You know, we've got people that worry a lot about, you know, memory and how it's used and, you know, diary of datum and all that. It, it's a multidimensional thing, and I don't know. I don't know the work you're talking about, but does anyone look at abstraction upon multiple dimensions somehow? That to me is mind-bending, but it's where a lot of this is going to go. Yeah, the idea that you need to use different abstractions at the same time mm -hmm. because you're moving between perspectives and trying to do your thing, it's, it's a very human way to... So, so I mean, I think there's a... There's, there's uh, hold on a, a, a sec. Jonathan has his hand up. Yeah. yeah. Um, if if the goal is to squeeze the last Stop. ounce of performance, Phil. <laughs> if the goal is to squeeze the last ounce of performance out of whatever, then I would agree that abstraction probably will never work for all the reasons you just said. Yeah. Um, but if the goal is to get more people more productive doing concurrent programming, okay. then yes, I think we can come up with abstractions that will be helpful. Maybe not the ones we have right now. Um, but I think we can come up with abstractions that would certainly be helpful. Uh, Martin? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, a lot of it depends on how much, uh, on the properties of parallel computing, not computation. You've got huge tasks you can afford to have a advertise away a lot of really inefficiency. <coughs> Another phenomenon is that if you get a more powerful abstraction than you need, it's extremely well engineered, there's a ton of effort put into it by a lot of people, that can be often case better than, better than what you, you can get out of people working alone. The, the classical example of this is SAT solvers, which are inherently less efficient for some tasks than some specialized solutions, but nevertheless, you can't afford the best engineering opportunity to get the specialized solutions. The interesting thing is that still there are a lot of cases where you'd like to, where you'd like to do a reduction of the SAT solver, you can't do it because it's less efficient than you can roll it yourself. So, so there's a huge space of things that can happen. Okay, sorry. So I think maybe uh, I deliberately put us in a 
place far afield from the topic of the workshop, which is the, the abstraction question. But the premise of the workshop is on relaxing synchronization uh, to get the scalability. And um, was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> relaxing synchronization or relaxing specifications? Synchronization. That's what it said anyway. Whoops, sorry, wrong, wrong workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Then somebody pays if compared to a sequential and consistent world. And as a person who designs lots of APIs, I have spent more time turning the notion that I need some relaxation inside here into some precondition of some method that does not look remotely like it has anything to do with my my ulterior motives. Um, the, the canonical good example is um, our lightweight parallel framework, working pass. Um, I have a method called fourth. It's sort of fourth to pass. And um, it has a precondition that says that uh, you may not um, fork a task more than once. And if you disobey it, we can't actually catch it. Um, because if we could, we'd have to be sequentially consistent. So we can catch you sometimes, we can't catch you always. <coughs> so this is how things translate. And you know, that we, weakness shows up somewhere. It's got to show up somewhere. So the art form of API design is to take something that you need and to turn it into something that you want. Yeah. Um, it's really hard. I mean, that, that, you know, that was, that was, I thought, wow, Eureka. Clever, a clever way to get what I need for So I, I thought of something I'd like to try for this discussion. Since brevity is the soul of wit, and I, I value the ability to put something in one sentence, I will ask people here uh, to come up with a single sentence about the thesis of the workshop. Relaxing synchronization for scalability. If you gave a talk, it'd be even great if the sentence boils down the connection between your talk and the workshop to a single sentence. Doug asked me to boil down all the talks to their connection to the workshop, and I don't have the horsepower left to do it, but that's why I'm asking you guys to do it. One, for example, my talk, it would be um, the inevitable trade-off between latency and throughput shows why you need to relax synchronization if you're going to get scalable throughput. Now, take, take a moment if you need to, raise your hand when you've got one. One, one sentence. One sentence. Yeah, done. Okay. I'm going to cram four sentences into one sentence. <laughs> In order to reduce synchronization to achieve scalability, comma, yeah, thanks. Uh, you can do the punctuation, no periods. Uh, I feel like we need to you. bridge the gulf between the kinds of properties that Martin has talked about that are meaningful at the application level and the kind of primitives and techniques that a lot of folks here understand about managing all the resources at a much lower level, which taken in isolation maybe aren't relevant up here. But there's some kind of a compilation or mapping or transformation step from what matters to the application to all these details about making things work. Period. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'll never remember it. Yeah. We, are, we are recording. Okay, okay. So who else has one? Yeah, go ahead. This is a response to Martin's talk. Chill out, it looks good enough. Great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else have one? It's not easy. Go ahead, Max. Yeah, physical space time can provide a powerful unifying abstraction for massively parallel systems. Great. Wasn't that in uh, Landport's abstract in 1976? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Plagiarism is allowed. Hey, someone else. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? 
Yeah. I guess I was trying to summarize our thoughts just that uh, it, it's, it's possible to approach the improvements of the last organization without actually having a burden that uh, on the program. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. Yes. I'll follow that one up. Um, if you have a lax synchronization and you have enough developers and you have the right tooling, they won't see the burden. Great. More. This is, I love these one sentence Can I, can I ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in Trey's one line summary there, yeah, uh, there was something in that workshop about non determinism. Relax sync synchronization to get scalability. Relax synchronization so far that you end up with non determinism. He's saying he's going to hide it all from somebody up here. So, does that mean we're not doing the non determinism part? How, how does that relate to application apparent non-determinism? Is that? No? Uh, yeah, I don't think that you know, we were trying to, to tackle that problem. I mean, in fact, I had error bars on my grass. I don't know if you noticed because you know, they're multi-threaded apps. You run it five times, you get five slightly different uh, you know, execution times. So, so it's a fact that, of life. That's another problem. It's just a fact of life. Go ahead. Any more sentences right now? Because. We can move on for now. So yeah, go ahead, Mark. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Mark. Thank you, sir. Understand how much accuracy you need, and engineer your system to take advantage of the opportunity you have to relax accuracy to, 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 to take full advantage of the other accuracy. Great, great. I have a sentence that kind of pushes on your questions about abstraction. So, the success of software engineering has come from designing abstractions that conserve scarce resources by being profitable without resources. Semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> the new scarcity is communication. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll just answer this. Determinism, overrated, correctness, underrated. <laughs> <laughs> I'd argue, I, I think correctness is a false uh, syllogism, but that's me. I mean, but any, uh, you, you uh, Correctness is in the eye of the uh, beholder. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. the beholder pays the bills. That's true. Um, Relaxing synchronization for energy and efficiency is inevitable. Say that one more Relaxing time. Relaxing synchronization for energy efficiency is inevitable. For a what of efficiency? Energy, Energy efficiency. Energy. Oh, it's inevitable. Thank you. Sorry. So it's kind of like time here. I mean, Please. both the thoughts, mine included, focused on sort of mutual exclusion synchronization in the context of shared memory machines. But I think the real important thing is where you have large global scale distribution of computation that need to access some shared, some conceptually shared state. But there, that's where the bank is really going to come in for understanding. How up to date you have to be with it. And how long. And there, I think there will see a lot of uh, very, the things we would call relaxed synchronization with a much bigger payoff. Sorry, the, the applause. Uh, uh, I was saying, I think, I think, I think relaxing synchronization isn't going to mean, the biggest payoff isn't, hey, we don't get, to, hey, we, we get not to have lots in our program. Relaxing synchronization means, you know, I don't have to sit here and go through a whole bunch of rigmarole to be sure that I get the latest. The up to date, the millisecond up to date data from this machine a thousand miles away. Got it. So, um, let's see, I wanted to say something to try to reconcile the views. Uh, we heard several talks about uh, getting more performance as we relax synchronization so far to, to get things non deterministic. But I, I could call them Martin Renard camp, but that's okay. Other folks, other folks here too, as well. And uh, then Hans got up and gave his presentation. And the, uh, I think the way I took your presentation, Hans, I want to give you a chance to respond and rebut, was um, if you're using uh, a C compiler, a C++ compiler, it may betray you if you have data races. Uh, if you're on um, Intel processors, it's doing a lot of synchronization anyway, so why worry about races? And the uh, graph with the application not speeding up, 
I mean, the sort of the, 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 the snarky way to say that is if your application doesn't scale well with data races, there's no point in having data races. So is that a mischaracterization of your talk? It probably it is. is. I think that's not quite a correct characterization of the, of the talk. Okay. Uh, and so I mean, one point I wanted to get across is that if you, uh, you can get into trouble with data races, but no matter what platform you're on, uh, you, if you're willing to go down to something that's sort of, that's still difficult to use, but not as difficult to use as databases, these relaxed atomics, you can get the, you can get the performance you're after without uh, tempting the compiler to break your code. Mm -hmm. As far as the performance is concerned, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that that's, uh, that's an accurate characterization. I mean, this, this application didn't scale because of memory bandwidth, right? Mm -hmm. It's essentially past a certain point in any case. Uh, but I, I, I think that's totally, that's not that atypical for a lot of these applications. I think this application stopped scaling sooner probably because of the machine it was on. It was on an, on an early AMD machine which had limited memory bandwidth. Okay, because that, your experience seems to be different than say Martin's experience, just to pick Martin out again. Which Martin's experience seems to be that introducing data races really improved the scalability and performance of things. And your experience seems to be that it didn't. And I don't... We quite different, we were doing quite different things. I don't think these are inconsistent. How, resolve them, please. Uh, so I mean, the difference was I was adding only synchron I was adding synchronization to remove databases, whereas uh, Martin was removing or adding, whatever, however way you look at it, and adding synchronization to get sort of larger scale atomicity. So you were actually using synchronization, you were introducing or removing critical sections that actually significantly constrained the order in which things could be executed. Which I didn't, I no, I don't you, think think adding, you, you were talking about critical sections that potentially uh, actually serialized execution. Yeah. I wasn't in some sense. I was only, only in something enough synchronization to get rid of the databases. So let me answer that. I, I, the, so I had a version that was that I added just enough synchronization to get the atomicity I need to preserve the properties, to preserve you know the, the natural properties of the data structure. That version still had data races because any attempt I made to put in the additional atomics with the current technology crap. So yeah. I think this, that's an implementation artifact of, of using GCC 4.6 or whatever. That's not. No, but, but here's the thing, right? I don't see how you get rid of that data race on current hardware without putting in some, some fences that will go out of the point. Well, again, if you use mem the memory order relax, the minimum yeah. ordering, which gets you as close as, as close to the AC code as you can, uh, that doesn't need any fences on, on x86 or, on, or whatever. Or, or but, but here's the thing, here's the thing, right? That, that just gets me back to the code I had before, which was racing to preserve a lot of properties. What, that, what all that is is it's a different, much more involved way of getting to, I think, literally the same generated binary code. Could you, could, you just be, could you just be even lucky then? Yeah. You were just lucky. Okay, well, Doug, Doug is dying to say something again. Um, I would first say that you know, there's this real difference in attitude among those of us really, really do not want to be blamed when the missiles fire by <laughs> Okay, hold on a second, Doug, because I really want to reconcile their two experiences. And, uh, I think that's yeah. okay. point okay. is exactly the same. So the, the, no, the notion that there are, there are, um, there, that there are unsafe states that are so unsafe that, you, that people will die from the rattlesnake body and whatever, um, yeah. is a different set of concerns about whether you could actually reduce the atomicity or reduce the size of a critical section. I, I think Martin's code can be made to be completely memory safe, race free, at no cost if you gave me a week. But it would be that it would take me that long because you know if you look at it, there's only a couple of these vector additions, they could be done optimistically, there's there's a path so that you lose nothing and be correct. And you're just not willing to put the effort into it, and I can see why, because it's a throwaway program. 
when it's not really programmed then, why is there a state or deadline zero? Oh, okay, I, 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 I got your position. Is that your position too, Hans, or is it your position different? I think it's really similar to what I've okay. just said. Okay. So, so. Um, but I mean, I also, I think I can I saw something that works as well as, as office happens to work that follows the rules. Okay, so, so I just, I'll, I'll get to you guys in one sec. That's a tough argument to make. You know, Martin, if you were just as smart as these guys, you would. You would have <laughs> Go. <laughs> Go ahead. Now. What about what about ten thousand cores or a hundred thousand cores in Amdahl's law? I mean, if you've got this much in your hardware or your language or whatever, you got just the smallest serial section. You get enough cores sitting there. Aren't they all eventually going to end up lined up, waiting, or hung up? But the synchronization we're talking about, the new basis doesn't have. So, what, so well, I didn't hear Doug say for free. I don't know if you meant really totally for free. There's no. Okay, so. I was promising something stronger, but So I think I can put this particular thing to bed and then go on by saying that the three of you are each drawing on very different experiences. Martin's experience is that making things dangerous worked well, and there and any safe way he could have thought of or tried wouldn't. Uh, your two experiences is that you have, in the past, found problems where you have made things pretty safe or, or as safe to some point and gotten them to work well. And speculations about what you could do in a week are more speculation that I think are deriving from the experiences you've had. And now let me call on, on I can't remember names, I'm sorry, Christoph. but go ahead. Christoph, Christoph go ahead. Uh, so isn't it, I mean, this whole thing, isn't it about, you know, uh, we have some, there's some specification that you want to implement, there's a particular platform that comes with cost for synchronization and computation, etc. And then, and then the actual fundamental question is to figure out what is the intrinsic cost in terms of synchronization and communication to implement this particular specification. And the only difference here between Martin and Hans seems to me is that they are looking at different, very different kinds of specifications with very different kinds of cost or amount of cost in terms of synchronization and communication. So the, the actual question, question is, what is the intrinsic cost to do something, to do a particular, to implement a particular specification? Uh, that's not the way I would frame the problem, but okay. And Doug, you wanted to say something. I just before. wanted to put, put something on the on the queue. Uh, so a second ago, there was a comment about I don't want to write the code that explodes the bomb that does the this and that. That the question I wanted to ask somewhere during the day was, uh, what are the space of applications that are amenable to these techniques? Like you know, there, Martin's had some slides first thing this morning about finance and search of this, and and also Ravi did, and I. Is there something written somewhere? Has anybody done some studies that says, yeah, this much of the computing cycles of the world or this many applications or something are amenable to this? Because some things aren't. You know, so that's a question, open question now. So we had one slide on that. I saw the slide, but you know, is there someone that's done a real study on how many places you can you can be? Uh, uh, what was this phrase in the phrase in the paper? Accurate enough, often enough or something, and it's okay. I think the first order, easy approximation, Anything for which a randomized algorithm has been devised is, um, can, can take advantage of non-algorithmic um, randomness via races. And that's an easy, big chunk of the, the space. Uh, so go ahead. I think we're so, so I think I think I think there might be a, a step in between, and which is to say that we need metrics by which we can say whether the thing has been working or not. Who can revert back? So, so really, from an engineering point of view, we really probably need two versions, right? And say, and if there is some some syndrome, some signature which we can develop, okay, which tells us that we've gone very far from. Well, wasn't from that the one of the talks we had? Yeah, today? there was. It was one of the talks, right? right. And and then then we can revert back. So it doesn't have to be uh, one or the other. So I think the, the big difference for me is there's a set of traditional information processing applications, things like. Uh, compiling, probably databases, where you've got enough control and the system is small enough that 
for the particular computation you're looking at, you don't lose information, you don't apply for observations. But for the vast amount of remaining computations, there's approximation involved somewhere, but it's only the approximation of the model we use. Or, you know, all this kind of stuff. But so there, might be, there might be some scientific, like, new, where people have argued about the numerical precision, okay, and where, yeah, where it might not be. Yeah. Yeah. Any floating point computation, for yeah. example, has at least some tolerance for approximation. lectures on bridges falling down because of people using floating point and not understanding it properly. That's right. You know, it wasn't accurate enough often enough, was it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's see. Any any more uh, base level thoughts? We'll, we'll probably hit meta level soon. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Oh, I'm just, I'm just to see someone in this room take one of Martin's examples and safify it and get and get you know about the same performance that Martin has. I mean I think I think if you go to someone and say, well I could take your thing and give me a week and I could make it better in some significant respect when that person says, you know, it doesn't seem like you can, it it would be a very honorable thing to do. No, I'm not going to go take so I think I know exactly how to do it. Okay? Yeah. So the first thing you gotta do is you gotta make the critical section for the updates and insert elements and the things faster. Okay, maybe you do some sort of compare and swap instruction, something like that. I'm using you know standard VTEX locks. That would get you a long way. The second thing has nothing to do with program, it has everything to do with art. Swap will break down with contention. Yeah, but there's not going to be a lot of contention here, which is why you can get good parallel performance at all. Okay. Okay? Um, the other thing you've got to do is you then argue that the program, even though it contains data races, on the machine you're on top of is safe in some sense. So there's two components. One is, one is you know, taking away some of the overhead for the critical section. The other is just an argument that on the machine you're running on, it's okay. But, you mean but, but this, this is not true. If you take... Anytime I've seen anybody try this, yeah. the first thing they do is spend three days scratching their heads at why they're not getting what they're getting, and then pretty soon they're in the hardware looking at cache coherence protocols, memory <coughs> and everything else. It just gets interesting because stuff gets in the way. There's hidden taxes on scalability and whatnot. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm saying there's a lot of stuff there, and I do believe it can't be done if you can do it for a zillion cores because those little bits eventually add up. Big enough problem, there will be contention. So I, I, I'm detecting a uh, a little bit of sort of quasi looping, and we have dinner and the workshop process to discuss. Yeah. Are there any base level comments people are, are kind of dying to get out before we move up, before we up level? Yeah, go ahead. I'll make a controversial statement perhaps. If you get a big benefit from relaxing synchronization, your algorithm is probably broken, and you should fix your algorithm first. And why do you believe that? That's been my experience. Okay. So, uh, uh, responding to that, but something I've been wanting to say for a while, and then I said to a couple of people in private, 
we had a, quite a few discussions get derailed today by, well, wait a minute, what is your definition of races? And then everyone says their definition is like, oh, these are the same, what's the problem? It's not about what the definition is, it's about what are the implications, right? So I spend quite a bit of time in Hans-like world and quite a bit of time in Martin-like worlds. And in the Hans-like world, you know, the, the, the metaphor we always use is if you have a race, your machine can catch fire. Now, if most of us, most of the time, there's actually, unless there's a bug in the operating system or a new interface, please catch fire, that's actually not going to be the real implication. We're in some kind of virtualized environment that's going to control the worst case even for malicious programs, right? Now, if you guys are both in a military facility that actually has an interface to fire, fire the missiles, I bet you'll find yourselves in agreement about a lot more things, right? I think there are fencing requirements, and then right, and those are requirements intended to convert to the Yeah. Okay. So I'm not saying you'll converge the same solutions, but I'm saying you'll have similar opinions about how how much is it okay to sort of speculatively remove some locks. Okay, so a couple of minutes left for base level stuff. Yeah, Phil. Um, so listening to some of the discussion about changing algorithms by putting coherent swaps into the retry loops and all that kind of stuff, it reminds me an awful lot of the ugly CCABL code that I put up in my talk. Um, I wonder if maybe some of the people that are doing that kind of work ought to take a look at relativistic programming and get the benefits they want without the evidence. Okay. Um, good point. Uh, any last? Last, we have maybe time for one more base level. Yeah, go ahead, back. Uh, just at a very general level, um, I, was, I, was maybe, I missed some part of the conversation, but maybe discuss this too. Uh, so we, we, we design algorithms, and we're always thinking about the worst case. And we, we, we code things up, and we always think about the corner cases. So, so is there, do, people, do people regularly think about the worst thing that could po possibly happen if, if you know, races occur and things start going tragically wrong? Uh, is there a better way to bound the amount of damage that can possibly happen? It, it has that I think the answer is yes, but we don't have time to go into it now because that, that would have been a good thing to bring up when we had more time since it's a question. Uh, but we've used up the 45 minutes that everybody voted on for group discussion. If you wanted more, you needed to cut down the papers. Maybe take a quick vote if people want to stay another 15 minutes or half an hour.